Good evening, friends. I hope you are very well this evening. It's almost 8.30 and it's about 3 degrees centigrade. So it's freezing here in the Meerkat Magic Valley Reserve of the Meerkat Magic Conservation Project. And with another load shedding from ESCOM, our power provider in South Africa, for another four and a half hours, the power will be off. I decided to go for a lovely little walk around the reserve. And in fact, I'm heading down to the Stone Dojo Riverine Swimming Pool. After the recent rainfall, the river is flowing strongly. A lot of detritus has washed down. For those who haven't seen the previous video, you can see that on my channel. Just have a look there and you'll find all of the updates. It's beautiful walking through this area at night because of the nighttime sounds. There are lots of what sounds to be popping sounds, which are the frogs and the toads all calling to each other. It's, of course, a great time for them to get together and breed with all of this extra water in the area. Even now, the ground is soaked after a few days of rainfall. There's no loose dust here at all. It's very, very cold because of all the water in the area. But I'm exceedingly grateful because every animal and plant in this area is thriving now with all the extra water. All right, we're nearly down at the river. And you can hear the nighttime sounds. Of course, there are many fish in this river. The Cape Clawless Otter also comes to visit here. I see there's been a lot of digging from the ant bear in the area too, because of all the termites that it eats. They've been swarming, and because of that, it's a termite's worst nightmare, having a Richteropus aphor, the artfark, the end bear, out on the prowl. I have to be very careful here because it's extremely slippery. This is basically where all the steps used to be going down into the river. For those who've seen the previous videos, all of this has washed away now. And you can see how quickly the water is moving. We're going to get a bit lower here. Hopefully I'm not going to slide in. And I see already this is very, very slippery here. But we're going to go down here anyway. Nothing like a bit of adventure at night. Never know what kind of creatures we might encounter. Of course, during the daytime, with the water being crystal clear again, you can see large crabs the size of two human hands together, basically, walking around, feasting on all the detritus that has washed down from the Great Black Mountain Range to the north, which is, of course, part of a World Heritage Site, the Cape Floristic Region, Machia, Feinbos. Just love seeing all this water flowing down here. It's wonderful. Some of the massive rocks that have moved into this area over time. You can see how they've been rounded by the water from the river. They, of course, all come from the Great Black Mountain Range, many kilometers away up to the north. And this entire area is a corridor full of wildlife. I'm surprised the frogs and toads are so quiet at the moment. Maybe the water's a bit fast for them in this area and they've moved downstream. But usually in the dams, the Stone Dojo Dam, for example, and the northernmost dam, whenever there's water in that, they're calling and calling and calling. Can't really see much more at the moment. The riverbanks have eroded quite a lot here, this section. All right, let's go find some frogs and toads calling. I can definitely hear them further up the stream. Let's actually take a detour. Currently I'm heading south, south 
east. Almost in the direction of the town of Utsuren, which is about 18 kilometers away from where I'm currently standing. Way off in the distance. There's a bit of light pollution coming up from there. Fortunately, because the reserve is situated behind riverbanks, it's difficult to even see the light pollution. The porcupine has also been very active here. It's more than possible that I come across one foraging. They are very active when it's dark like this. And when I say it's dark, I'm talking about almost no moonlight at all. A little sliver this evening. So they can be very secretive and go hunting the juicy roots that they feast on in this area. That's the Africa porcupine, Hystrix africa australis, also known as the Easter Fark, the iron pig. Easter is iron, Fark is pig in Afrikaans. So, direct translation would be the iron pig in Dutch, Stiegel Fark, and in German, Stachelschwein. Like a stickly, sticking pig or prickly pig. Such interesting names. Ah, here we go. This is an incredibly dense jungle area. Approximately 200 meters away already from the riverine swimming pool. And here you can just pick up on all the sounds because the water will have slowed a lot as it gets into the very densely overgrown jungle here. Now this is certainly not something I would advise to anybody who doesn't know an area very well. You don't just go walking off into the wilderness at night unless you're looking for trouble because you could go find a hippopotamus or another creature in the area. They used to be in this area way back in time. So did elephants. And you definitely don't want to be walking around there when they are active. Here, of course, there are bush pig. Potamo querus porcus. So, they have to be careful because they could be exceedingly dangerous if cornered with their tusks. They could shred somebody in moments and, of course, they're omnivores. So you do not want to be caught out in the open by one of them. Such a funny name that, Potamoquerus porcus. Yeah, I remember when I was in Uganda back in the 90s in Queen Elizabeth Park. That's the area of the giant forest hounder. Sounder at least. Yeah. Hollow Quarius Ethiopicus. And then the porcupine is Faco Quarius. That's P H A C O. Faco Quarius Ethiopicus. So a bit of a spider web here. This place is very overgrown, but I can see after the recent flooding, all of this area, which is usually very dried out, is completely washed out. See how the water has just pushed through the vegetation here, left a muddy trail behind some of the beautiful riverine trees here. Yeah, this is much, much slower here now. Wow, there's some serious logs that have been pulled down here as well. And it's about 30 meters across to the other bank. But they are definitely quieter areas now, and that's why I'm hearing frogs not far from here. <sighs> that's the breath. Water vapor, because it's so cold here. Yeah. I'm wearing three jackets and two woolen caps and a hoodie and gloves. Yeah.
But if you want to get out at night to hear the nighttime sounds, you need to get out there. All right, there's a lot of detritus. Wow, so much has washed down and it slowed the water flow right down here as well. Creating a habitat for many amphibians. And of course, the Cape Clawless Otter Aeonyx Capensis will be moving through this area hunting fish and crabs as will a Tilex polludinosus, the water mongoose, and then the Egyptian mongoose, Herpestes ecnumon, will also be coming through the area to hunt. Of course, they have such incredible hearing, they would have heard me a long time ago and moved off if they were in this immediate area. Just to give you an idea of how dense this jungle is right now, Just taking my gloves off here to show you. This is what I call an ambush. Yeah, that's right. And the one mistake, because if you hit one of these thorn trees, this is in fact the acacia karoo, sweet thorn, sudoran, which you may be familiar with if you've watched any of my other videos. These are basically lying in wait for the unwary adventurer. If you walk through this area, without long pants on, such as I've got now, you're basically asking for trouble from the ambushes. The one mistake, because you only make that mistake once, of course, and you should learn. Wow, these reeds have shot up. These are maybe six meters high. They're gigantic. Phragmites australis. We don't get the bambooza belcour here typical bamboo but there are lots of alien plants as well which I'm not happy to see at all for those of you who know my videos you'll know I hunt alien plants but I see this has been recently chewed on this is the Turistramonium not ferox ferox has much larger thorns on the fruit they have atropine very dangerous plants you don't want to mess around with these these are often called mulpita basically hallucinogenic <laughs> Mull is mad. So, and pitta are basically seeds. All right. I'm also glad I'm wearing long pants here because here we have another pest invader plant which is washed down from the river from upstream. I'm not even going to touch it because these are nettles, stinging nettles. Yeah, it's so amazing after this rainfall to see plants that usually would not occur here, like these mushrooms. Everything is wet and rotting and growing and it's very interesting down here so many different pathways and of course finding my way around at night is always very entertaining i know every meter of this reserve from many many years since 2008 i've been here i've walked all over the place during the nighttime, daytime, I've run all over the area. And of course, that's through all the different seasonal variations. It's wonderful to see the area as it goes through the different changes from the drought years to the extreme wet years like now. And here we can have a look at some of the very large, very inhospitable thorns, just to give you an idea. I still have one of them wedged into my finger from three and a half weeks ago. Got jammed into the bone. I have to wait for it to grow out. Yeah, one of the risks of digging through the area, these thorns are very unforgiving and they often have nasty chemicals and so on on them because there is a bird in this area known as the butcher bird Lanius colaris deluxeman and their habit of tool usage is to pin scorpions 
and that's where the venom on these thorns can also come from. Geckos, locusts, including very toxic ones, and all sorts of other creatures much larger than these birds can easily handle, they pin them onto thorns and basically dry them out, almost like a butcher creating jerky or biltong. And then they'll come back later to retrieve their supplies. Unfortunately, if you get one of these thorns stuck in you, you're basically playing Russian roulette with all those potential poisons or venoms and other nasty secretions that could be on those thorns. So I have had blood poisoning before from these thorns spiking me. And that is not an experience I recommend to anybody. So it's best to wear protective gear whenever you're around these kind of thorns is a short story. All right. I'm going to keep on heading up, doing quite a big adventure session here. Being down to that section of the property. The stone dojo is approximately 800 meters away up on a hill to the north, yeah, north northeast ish from here. All right, let's go and see the dense overgrowth. This would be extremely dangerous to do in summer because of the resident snakes, which are currently estivating. It's basically like hibernation, but for reptiles, so they'll be in burrow systems, keeping nice and warm and being sensible. All right, this is from a porcupine dig. Not recently, because the rainfall has washed away any fresh tracks but those fairly shallow digs are for roots and tubers the ant bed dig is much deeper usually you might come across some fresh tracks from them again i'm just sticking on one of these wildlife highways aha uh -huh. there's another dig also from a porcupine. Now in my book, Meerkats from 2016, I discuss the importance of these fossorial digging mammals, not just the meerkat and mongoose, but all the other hotel residents in these burrow systems. These excavations allow water to easily infiltrate very compacted soil, which allows seeds to get trapped in there with spider webs and other creatures basically moving into the area and then dung is often deposited deposits from meerkats who just eat a juicy grub for example they'll often use the hole that they've dug to deposit the dung porcupine also leave dung in the area and that can get washed into these holes and then of course the plants have a very good chance of germinating far better than just being on the surface and then getting washed away or blown away so for anybody who has issues with Soil degradation, intensive runoff or real erosion, digging mammals are the answer to reversing that process because they will dig thousands of holes, basically like crater plows, which is a known way of helping to rehabilitate compacted soil in areas where the topsoil has eroded away. So, all of these diggings, such as this again, it's deceptive at night. This is about 20 centimeters in depth. All of these diggings, to get to my point, are exceedingly beneficial to an area to prevent flooding, which can cause huge soil loss. So where livestock have trampled an area because they've been there for too long, i.e. ostriches in small camps, they can desertify an area and trample it 
and prevent runoff from entering into burrow systems which have often been trampled all right we are way up on one of the boundaries i see a huge amount of detritus has washed down here now from the recent floods and the water is flowing very strongly upstream however i can still hear some frogs so there must be little pockets of slower water Going to head up towards the reserve wind pump, taking you all on the grand tour this evening. I've already walked a few kilometers since leaving the research base. Ah, there are a lot of frogs calling now up here. I know where they are. There's an inlet near the reserve wind pump. Where water tends to seep through after the flooding. And that's a breeding haven for these amphibians. My friends out there who are conservationists, especially of amphibians, this is a paradise here for them. All right, I am now in the northernmost Lucerne field near the reserve wind pump. For those who know my previous videos, you'll know where I am. And where you are at the moment on this virtual tour with me. All right, I tend to walk quite quickly on these more open areas, especially when I know there are no snakes about. Just a pro survival tip whenever you in a wilderness area, never look too far ahead. Keep your eyes scanning just ahead of you because of the snakes. All right, there's a bit of a breeze coming up now. Yeah. Oh, that needs a bit of an oil after the rain. Squeaky wind pump. That sounded like a Capri Mulgus. We've got night jars in the area. Which are very secretive during the daytime periods. But at nighttime, as the name implies, that's when they are very active. It looks like those frogs and toads might be on the other side of the riverbank at the moment. So, let's see if I can track down some others. I'm walking through one of the Lucerne fields at the moment. It was harvested a few weeks ago and already it's over 30 centimeters in height. There's an entire album on my Facebook page for the Lucerne Fields, if you'd like to know more about them. 
Medicago Sativa. It's full of vitamin E. It's also quite high in protein and can be eaten raw, basically added into salads. Apparently, it's often eaten by pregnant ladies because of all the nutrients it contains. The roots are incredible because these can go down to 18 foot plus in depth and channel a vast amount of nitrogen into the soil. So even though an area might look dead, these roots can suddenly produce many leaves within a matter of days after getting a good soaking. This field is very well established, first grade lucerne. So it's all lucerne, there are no weeds or anything growing here. And it takes four to eight years to establish lucerne like this. So it's not a quick process. I see there's a lot of digging again here. The porcupine has in fact visited here recently and has made a little crater here going for the lucerne roots. They do eat the roots of the lucerne. These little bald patches are from them. But there's so much lucerne in the area. It's what I like to call nature's tax. There are many inhabitants of the reserve and they all take their quota of what they would like to eat but they maintain the equilibrium in this reserve. Right, I'm nearly at the northernmost dam. I'm also not that far from the Tsabokolodi Yellow Mongoose's main sleeping area. I'm not going to go past them, potentially disturb them now. I see another weed has come into this area. This is verbena. Might be familiar with it. It has beautiful purpley flowers and it's characteristic from verbenacea is cross section. It is in fact like a square. It's not round the stem. Difficult to make out now but that's the case. I don't like seeing them here. However they are controlled because they're in the canals. So they're not spreading further into the reserve. All right, this is very overgrown here since I was last in this area. Wow. Give you an idea of the dense vegetation. Of course, meerkats will commonly climb up into vegetation like this here. Ah, there's a lot of verbenacea that has moved in from the canal systems. This needs a follow-up visit with a machete. You need to come chop them out. They're quite easy to control. Usually they just stay close to the water sources. Wow, this is so overgrown. I wonder if we can get up onto the northern bank. And I see... Just from the rainfall, there's still water flowing through this little canal system here, which is wonderful for the wildlife. Hmm. All right, let's see if we can get up that pathway there. This is very slippery. So, just going to do this carefully. This bank is over 30 meters high, to give you an idea. So if it wasn't so well covered in vegetation, it would be far more hazardous attempting this climb now. Ah, finally we're getting to the frogs and the toads. It's almost deafening. Those who are patient are rewarded. Ah, oh, it is so overgrown here now. I'm not sure I can even walk along this bank anymore. Mm. 
super overgrown. <sighs> this is very deceptive because that's almost a sheer drop way down to the lower Lucerne field. I don't usually take this route at night, that's for sure. It's quite dangerous at night with the slippery soil as it is. Let's see if this looks a bit like a pathway here. Very overgrown. But I want to get closer to the frogs and the toads. Maybe we'll even come across them. All right, this again, very dense. Ah, here we go. All right. The northernmost dam actually has water in it right now, which I was not sure about. All right, here we are. And this is a very large dam. It's actually longer than the one at the Storm Dojo. And I'll just listen to some of the night sounds. What is that? Two crickets skimming along the surface. of the water has already drained out of this dam but it's probably about 40 to 60 centimeters deep oh I see some movement there of course they're fish in the dam as well still fairly quiet Of course, all of the inhabitants here are very well aware of my presence and of course with this light. It will take them a few moments just to realize that nothing is happening to them. Uh, already they're getting more and more vocal. at the water's edge on my launches sinking into the mud yeah oh and I see I'm being a seed dispersal agent right now a quick botany lesson this is Cetaria verticillata, also known as Klitzgras. Yeah. And what it does, as you can see here, it has very sticky seeds which attach onto any passers by. So I'm in fact currently an agent for seed dispersal. And the technical scientific term for this would be epizucori. Yeah, zucori would just be dispersal by animals, but epizucori is external seed dispersal. Then, of course, there's hydrocori, seed dispersal through water, anemocori through wind, sorocori from reptiles, ornithocori from birds, and so on. Right, the chorus is definitely picking up now. Let's have a listen. Oh, I absolutely love that white noise. It's wonderful. I 
I'm probably about two kilometers away from my research base at the moment, so I'm going to start heading back because this light may well die out and it's a very dark night and I'm surrounded by thorns so <laughs> and muddy banks to climb out of all right so I'm going to head on back until next time I hope you enjoy your adventures outdoors for those who've stayed until the end of this little adventure <laughs> appreciate your company and I'm gonna head out this way oh, it's extremely dense vegetation here what a climb even getting out of this area all right so check out the albums for the northernmost dam the riverine area if you'd like to see what the area looks like during the daytime, you may already be familiar with it, and those who have visited will know it well. All right, time to head back while I've still got some torchlight battery left. All the best, everyone. Until next time.